tolerate a specific chemical reaction using that light. So in this case, the reaction which we are accelerating is the degradation of photocatalyst pools. So how do these photocatalysts work? Essentially, they involve the excitation of electrons. You have a material, whatever that material may be, in my case, I'm using metal oxides. You strike it with a photon of light, and that excites electrons from the default state in which they're in, the valence band, all the way up to the conduction band. Once the electron is excited by the conduction band, that electron is free to undergo a wide range of chemical reactions. In this case, we're attempting to induce the degradation of the aforementioned organic dyes. So once that electron is excited, what it does is that it reduces an oxygen molecule to an oxygen radical, and then the remaining hole, which is essentially the absence of an electron, can produce hydroxyl radicals. These hydroxyl radicals are the same thing we use in cleaning products to clean your clothes or clean your dishes or whatever. And so what we're attempting to do here is to degrade these pollutants using this extremely environmentally safe and cost-effective process. So with every good thing, they have their limitations. Photocatalysts have many limitations, namely the inefficiency of the photocatalysts. Trying to drive reactions using this excitation is unfortunately not a very effective process, and so it's very important to attempt to accelerate this rate of reaction. Photocatalysts also have this very unfortunate property of being very expensive. Not only are the raw starting materials comparatively expensive to start with, but the synthesis of these materials in order to get them to a home that you can successfully utilize is also extremely difficult. Finally, you are, or third of all, you have electron hole recombinators. So I mentioned here that when you strike an electron in the valence band to the conduction band, it usually undergoes a series of reactions. But this is not what always happens. A lot of the time there's this issue where the electron will just jump right back down. And this limits the efficiency. You've essentially wasted a photon of light. And when this happens at accelerated rates, you end up having a very, very slow rate of reaction. You end up losing a lot of energy. Another issue is particle aggregation. Because we are dealing with heterogeneous catalysts that exist in a different phase than the reaction, so my metal oxide phase is to solids, they're catalysts, essentially. While the reaction is happening in water, a liquid medium, one of the problems that ends up happening is that these particles tend to aggregate. Once these particles aggregate, you lose out on a lot of potential surface area. And so you have a very low overall rate of reaction. Finally, you have cyclability. Imagine after spending all that time synthesizing your materials and all that time purchasing them, that you end up having a material that only works once and then it doesn't do what you want it to do. These are all issues that exist with photocatalysts, <coughs> and they're essentially things that we're trying to mitigate. So, how are we going to do this? For this project, I used zinc oxide tetrapods, which are a very unique geometric structure. After these photocatalysts were obtained, I prepared several solutions <coughs> of organic dyes. The dye that I used was methylene blue, which is one of the most prevalent and one of the most dangerous when we're talking about water sanitation and purification. So I prepared solutions of different concentrations of methylene blue in order to essentially replicate the wastewater that I'm attempting to purify. After I prepared these solutions, what I was able to do was I was able to add controlled quantities of my catalyst in predetermined ratios, and I was then able to compare just how well my catalyst is at degrading these organic molecules. So, in order to test the catalytic degradation, one of the techniques I used was UV vis spectrophotometry. So, the way in which this technique works is that it essentially measures the absorbance of a sample. You have a sample, whatever that may be, in my case it's my solution with whatever pollutants I have dissolved. You strike it with different wavelengths of light, and then you look at how much of that light passes through, or is transmitted, and how much of that light is absorbed. By performing this calculation, you're able to use a very cool chemical law in order to determine exactly what the concentration of pollutant that you have left in solution is. So by using this technique, I was essentially able to map out the progressive degradation of dyes in my solution. I had my solution, I struck it with light, and I took continuous samples in order to study the rate at which the, this degradation happens. So, what have I been able to do? Uh, first of all, for my zinc oxide tetrapod, I was able to determine through scanning electron microscopy that these indeed were structured as tetrapods. They have these legs, they have this center, and they have the structure essentially that I have been aiming for. Afterwards, I was able to test the degradation. So it's very important here to notice that this progressive degradation that's happened. So you've got this peak at around 653 nanometers, which is the absorbance point of methylene blue. 
as time progressively goes on, what is happening here is that the absorbance is decreasing. This is a consequence of the methylene blue being degraded by my catalyst continuously into less detrimental organic compounds. So progressively, as you go on and on and on, you can see these decreases in absorbance, which correlate to that degradation that I'm attempting to study. So once you graph this absorbance versus time, you can see a very linear and direct trend in this reaction. So this is a pseudo first order reaction, which means that it's a second order reaction, but it functions or can be treated as a first order one, which has a linear relationship of concentration and time. And progressively, as we're going on, as we're taking different times, you can see that the absorbance progressively continues to decrease. And this is a very good thing. You ideally want the lowest amount of dye to be present, and you want to degrade that as fast as possible. So this is essentially what I have been able to do. Uh, this is a summary of my results. Um, so the zinc oxide tetrapods that I worked with had a very high degradation. And essentially what I've been able to do is I've been able to compare them against some of the benchmark catalysts that we currently use in the literature. These include titanium dioxide, cerium dioxide, and zirconium dioxide. These benchmark catalysts are what are most commonly used in the literature, and I was able to compare the degradation efficiency of my own catalyst, which is the zinc oxide tetrapods, versus the degradation capacity of these different benchmarks, essentially. And I was able to determine that my catalyst is 229% more efficient than zirconium, 124% more effective than cerium, and 254% more effective than titanium. What this means is that essentially when you have situations, when you have some more part of country where individuals are in dire need of purified water, the rate at which this degradation occurs is extremely important. The difference of a couple of days in terms of this degradation efficiency of waiting for some light to strike your catalyst to purify whatever, you, uh, whatever water you have could be the difference between life and death for many different people. And the implications of this are very widespread in terms of not only understanding the underlying process, but in terms of being able to effectively apply this in the situations that need them most. Thank you very much. Uh, these are the people I would like to acknowledge. I'd like to acknowledge Kaos, the, the Strategic National Advancement, my mentorship team, the SRSI team, the tutoring team, everybody. So thank you very much. So these, uh, the catalyst that you were using is homogeneously dispersed in your uh, solution, I believe, right? I, mean, I haven't dispersed it. So, but, it, but it's inside of the solution, it's not on the, uh, uh, let's say, on the surface, or it's just inside, right? Yeah, it's just inside. So what do you think would be the, so usually when you would like to release such water after contamination is degraded, you would need to probably remove the catalyst, right? So is this an issue for your particular catalyst that you think about it? And no, this is one of actually one of the advantages that we have with heterogeneous catalysts. So heterogeneous catalysts exist in an entirely different phase than those of homogeneous catalysts. So in a heterogeneous catalyst, you have your catalyst in one state of matter. So in my case, it's a solid. And then you have your reactants or your substrates, which exist in a solid form, or here they exist in solution. So because my catalyst never actually dissolves, it's very easy to simply separate it out. If you just leave my solution without stirring, eventually all of the catalyst will just settle to the bottom. And so it's very easy to purify. Essentially, all you need is, a, think of it like a cup of tea. When you put tea in water after you're done brewing, you just filter it off and it's done. So does, it, does the catalyst itself degrade uh, with time? And if so, how fast does it degrade? That's one of the things that I have not had time to study, but I hope to study that in the future. So essentially, the cyclability and degradation of the catalyst is a very key and important point. But one of the reasons that we've chosen metal oxide water catalysts is that they tend to show very, very high uh, resistance to overall degradation. The substance itself is very stable. And one of the things we hope to study is how stable it is as a catalyst. So the cyclability of the process. But I hope to say that. Thank you. That's a very good point. <laughs> what are exactly the degrading products of methylene blue? Okay, that's a very, very good question. There are lots of products for the degradation of methylene blue. I think I have an extra slide. 
So yeah, mezzanine blue degrades through a lot of different degradation pathways, and it's one of the things that we don't actually deeply understand. So currently, the best approach that exists in the literature for the studying methane blue degradation is to essentially get a mass spectrometer and then just try to study as much intermediates as possible. But what tends to happen when you're discussing methane blue degradation is that it tends to form other organic compounds, it form other organic compounds. But as you progressively go forth, the main target that you can <coughs> achieve is to produce water. So all the hydrogen in that original organic molecule gets oxidized and oxidized until you get to water. All the carbon keeps going and going and going until you get CO2. And eventually, if you degrade it for long enough, whatever inorganic products, so things that don't have carbon, oxygen, or hydrogen in them, will start to mineralize. So uh, you'll have NH3 ions, you'll have SO4 ions, and all those will crystallize into a, a brown slime-like structure. Any other questions? Do you mind raising your voice, please? Uh, we haven't talked yet, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How difficult was to create the, the, the crystal itself? Because you, you, you did the tetrapods, you mean? Yeah. So I didn't actually make the tetrapods myself. We obtained them from Saturn. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Suleiman.